Customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you are a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. There are a lot of attributes that come into play in becoming a great leader. One of them is being able to inspire everyone in your organization to rally around a common purpose and ignite their passion to execute your vision. In order to do that, you need to be a good presenter. Being a great presenter involves a combination of skills, techniques, and personal attributes. Are you ready to up your presentation skills? Join John DeJulius and Dave Murray for a two-day workshop and learn the keys to nail your next presentation. They'll cover the five elements of a great presentation, how to have more confidence in front of an audience, how to engage with your audience, storytelling, the effective use of visual aids, how to turn your presenting weakness into a strength, and much, much more. For more information, contact Claudia at thedejuliusgroup.com or visit thedejuliusgroup.com for upcoming training and events. Welcome, revolutionaries, to the Customer Service Revolution podcast. I am John D. Julius, Chief Revolution Officer of the D. Julius Group. On this episode, I interview Chris Kosick, the CEO of Gallant Branding and the author of the book, Any Insights Yet? Connect the Dots, Create New Categories, and Transform Your Business. Chris is also a TEDx speaker and has been featured in many national publications. Before we get to the interview, let's talk about what's happening in customer experience in the news. In a Forbes article, Klarna's new AI tool does the work of 700 customer service reps. Klarna, a Swedish-based company that offers a buy now, pay later option, allowing customers to purchase merchandise from retailers on layaway, has recently shared the mind-blowing financial results they are having. Klarna reports having over 150 million active users purchasing from more than 500,000 vendors. Daily, its website handles upwards of 2 million transactions. The company has 5,000 employees. In the past couple of years, Klarna has been crafting its own version called the AI Assistant, targeting the automation of a large portion of its customer service operations. Earlier this year, Klarna shared that their AI Assistant now adeptly manages inquiries concerning refunds, returns, payment issues, cancellation issues, disputes, and correcting invoice errors. It offers instant updates on pending balances and payment plans alongside advice on spending limits and alternative purchase strategies in more than 35 languages around the clock. Over the recent year, This AI assistant has engaged in 2.3 million conversations, accounting for two-thirds of all of customer service interactions, effectively performing the duties of 700 full-time customer service representatives. It matches the customer satisfaction levels of human agents and boast enhanced accuracy in resolving tickets, leading to a 25% reduction in follow-up inquiries. Tickets are now resolved in under two minutes, significantly improving from the previous 11 minutes. This tool is operational in 23 markets and supports over 35 languages. Klarna's AI assistant is said to have saved them over $40 million annually. 
CEO Sebastian Samotkowski said in a press release that this AI breakthrough in customer interaction means superior experience for our customers at better prices, more interesting challenges for our employees, and better returns on our investors. As for the impact on the Klarna workforce, this development serves as a cautionary note, signaling changes ahead. That's a good way of saying, watch out, people. Should employees be concerned? Some should. But good customer service agents will keep their jobs because they will be able to provide a higher level of service to more customer service than ever before. Mediocre performers that can be replaced by a bot will be replaced by a bot. If productivity, customer experience, and profitability using an AI tool instead of human beings, then marginal employees will be in danger. Today, small and medium-sized businesses can't afford such a significant investment in advanced AI solutions. But the landscape is changing. As larger corporations continue to invest in AI, technology will become more accessible and affordable. We'll be right back with our interview after this. What separates world-class customer service companies from everyone else? One significant factor is having someone dedicated to designing and managing the customer's experience. The Customer Experience Executive Academy trains leaders to excel at this. Find out how to enroll now. Contact Claudia at thedejuliusgroup.com for details. Welcome back, revolutionaries. On this episode, I am speaking to Chris Kosick, the CEO of Gallant Branding and the author of Any Insights Yet, Connect the Dots, Create New Categories, Transform Your Business. Chris is also a TEDx speaker and has been featured in many national publications. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you. I'm excited to uh, get into your topics. So let's first talk about Gallant Branding. What does Gallant Branding do? Yeah, so we're a branding boutique, a branding agency in Austin, Texas, and we work with brands to help them figure out, first of all, you know, what is their strategic positioning? So understanding who they are, who they're for, who their customers are, really defining those things, and then bringing that to life through, you know, clever and engaging design, whether it's for their packaging, their events, their website, their social media, uh, the whole nine yards. Okay, great. And, and and let's, you know, get to the book, Any Insights Yet? Connecting the Dots, Creating New Categories, and Transform Your Business. My research, when I'm looking at what you mean by insights, and obviously correct it and, and go deeper, is what I sometimes like to call an epiphany. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll have a leadership epiphany. And, and and sometimes it's painful. It means that I, I wasn't doing it right. Or sometimes I, I'll have what I call an experience epiphany you know, a new way of doing that. Do I have that right? And really tell us what you mean by insights. Yeah. So an epiphany is a great synonym for an insight. A lot of people talk about it as that aha moment that they discovered something. So it's it's new to them. The, the way that I define an insight is I use a metaphor. I describe it as like a constellation. Okay. So an insight, a lot of people will say- I didn't do good in uh, school, you know, so you might have to, well, layman's term this to me. Yeah, absolutely. So so a lot of times people will say, hey, I've got an insight, when really what they should have said is I've got an observation. And observations are good. Observations are powerful. But it's not an insight. But it's not an insight. And so I actually like to start by saying what an insight is not. It's not a data point. It's not an observation. Certainly not a tagline or a headline, although sometimes, you know, a tagline can be so good. People say, oh, that's the insight. No, it's just a tagline. Uh, It's not a human truth, although a human truth is very important. It's an important precursor to building an insight. Give me an example of a human truth. A human truth. Parents are time poor. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. When you're getting ready to to play a a professional sport, you want to get into the zone. That's true. I think I think everybody would agree with that. It's true. Yeah, I also feel like with, with the way you're going with it, these are more or less obvious, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where an insight shouldn't be obvious. 
Right. I mean, the, the very word itself, insight, right? If we were to break it down into its maybe Latin, you know, breakdown here, in, not, sight, visible. So it's something that's not actually visible to the naked eye a lot of times. It's something that you kind of have to construct or build. But the way people talk about insights is they make it seem like it's just something that you you stumble on. And again, you might stumble on a, an observation that then leads you to something bigger that is the bigger insight. So for me, an insight is all of those things coming together. That's why I like the constellation metaphor. You look up in the night sky, you're going to see the, the biggest and brightest stars. Maybe when you're a kid, you don't really see the pattern. You don't really notice, you know, what's going on there. And then someone points out to you, oh, yeah, see that one, that one, that one. That's the Big Dipper. All of those connect to make the Big Dipper. Or that one's Cassiopeia or, you know, things like that, right? So they point them out to you. Now you see it and you can't unsee it, mm -hmm. right? And the nice thing about the, the constellation metaphor is it's almost like there's a baked in idea of like the North Star. It gives you navigation, tells you where you need to go. So, so that's my definition of it, but it's a lot easier to understand it if I give you an example. Yeah, yeah, please do. And both, if you can, business, obviously, I, I, that's what your books are on, but I also love to, if you have a, a one personally, but let's start with the business, how it helps you transform a business. Yeah, so one of the examples I love is, so there's three different kinds of insights in, in my observation or my experience. One is a category insight. That's where you create an entirely new category. One is a brand insight where you reframe an existing category. And then one is a campaign insight where you basically come up with a campaign platform, an idea that's so big that you can run with it for 10, 15, 20 years. Okay. So we're going to go into each one of these. Yeah, for good. Good. Real quick second. So the first one is a category insight. Businesses like Airbnb. Netflix, Slack, Uber, or Lyft, okay? These businesses basically said, hey, we got a whole different way of doing things, right? Before Airbnb, you stayed at hotels. Right. You might stay at a friend's house. You might do a little couch surfing, but it wasn't like a business platform. And then Airbnb came along and said, hey, we noticed this, 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 and this. They noticed the individual stars in the constellation, and then they bring them all together to make a new business model. Netflix is a really good example. Easy, because everybody's heard of Netflix and is probably probably subscribes or yes. uses somebody else's subscription to get in. Yeah. Um, but the, the stars in the sky, one was that there was like a new tech shift, right? From VHS to DVDs. If videos were still happening on VHS, Netflix wouldn't exist. Right. Because, because DVDs were thin, light could go through the US Postal Service. Another star in the sky for Netflix was the shift from in-person browsing at video stores or places to people being comfortable with web browsing, okay? Amazon launched in 1994. Netflix launched in 1997. It's not a coincidence, and it's not an accident. As people started getting more comfortable looking at book summaries online, because remember, Amazon started with books, when Netflix came along, it was like, oh, Another catalog, this time for movies, okay? Movies and, and shows. So that comfort among consumers, very important, precursor. And then another observation that I think the founders of Netflix had, which is that the main product other than the DVDs themselves was actually the movie summaries, right? So mm -hmm. being able to have that catalog because the behavior in a video store, if you remember, was going to the store, picking up a video off the shelf, reading the summary on the back and saying, nah, not interested, right? Yeah. And doing that five or 10 times, sometimes leaving empty handed. And then Netflix. You couldn't watch the trailer back then. You nope. couldn't see what, uh, you know, a thousand other people reviews. That's right. Exactly. So technology has, has come a long way in helping with those decisions. And then Netflix also really understood the pain points that people were having with companies like Blockbuster, who was the, you know, the King Kong of the video space back in the late 90s. The first big pain point was those annoying late fees. You remember getting those? Which made up 13% of their revenue. That's right. A huge amount of their revenue. $800 million worth, I think. Yeah was the number. So good for Blockbuster, really annoying for a customer. So that's a right. pain. pain point number two, never enough copies of the video that right. you want, unless it's a Blockbuster, and even then you might not get it. And then number three, 
just going to the store technically was maybe like a latent pain point. People at the time would say, no, I like, you know, on a Friday, Saturday night, maybe go with some friends, pick out a video, go do something else and watch a video late at night, blah, blah, blah. But if people still really like doing that, we'd be going to the store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People like come, you know, things coming to them. So then Netflix, everybody else could have seen those individual stars. They could have seen the pain points. They could have seen the tech shift. They could have seen the cultural shift in people's uh, browsing and behaviors. Netflix took all of those things, brought it together and said, hey, we've got a potentially new business model. We're going to shift from rentals to subscriptions. That's a big business model shift. We're going to have a totally different delivery mechanism. So instead of you coming to a brick and mortar store, we're going to send it to you in the mail. Mm -hmm. Three, we're going to provide data driven recommendations. So from the outset, it was always, what did you think of this? Did you like it? And if you liked it, you're probably going to like these three other things. And they just built that platform deeper right. and deeper, and deeper. So that's a, that is a business disrupt or category disrupting business model. And nobody still has been able to catch Netflix. Right. Right. So that's a good example of a category insight. Branding. Brand insight is where you reframe an existing category. And nobody's doing this better right now, in my opinion, than liquid death. Okay. Okay. Water brand. It's just yeah. water. It's just water. <laughs> they are getting into iced tea and they're, they're doing some sparkling stuff now. But, but again, that started with an observation. Mike Cesario saw some people, the CEO, Mike Cesario, he saw a performer, I think it was, at a concert pouring out the Red Bull behind the stage and then filling the can with water. He thought, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Why are they doing that? Well, they're doing that because Red Bull is the sponsor of the, of the concert. But if you're going to play an hour and a half, two hour set, you might not want to get the jitters. You might not want to have an energy drink. You just want to stay hydrated. Right. So, so he noticed that. And then that sparked a question in his mind, which was, well, what if we made a water brand that looked as cool and was as fun as an energy drink brand? Because all the water brands out there are kind of kind of boring. Right. So we looked at that, asked that question, you know, some other stars in the sky, one of the trend lines, c customers or consumers want water on the go. That's been going on for 20 plus years. There was a cultural tension somewhere in there that he played with, which is plastic pollution. So many water brands are bottled up in plastic. Mm -hmm. And and so one pivot point there was, well, let's do it in a can. Let's do water in infinitely recyclable aluminum. Okay, so that's that's an interesting idea. A generational trend that, you know, they just happened to catch, or maybe you could say, oh, that's all part of their genius. But the rise in water sales is also in part due to millennials and Gen Z turning away from soda and beer simultaneously. So doing that and saying, hey, people are drinking more water, they want to be healthier, and they don't want to look like dorks when they're, when they're at a party. Right. So let's give them something that looks as much like a beer brand or something else, and they can feel confident with it. And then I think there's just this whole idea, one of the techniques I talk about in the book is, is asking what if questions. So I think one of Liquid Death's what if questions is what if we challenged or made fun of all marketing conventions in the category. We just have fun with marketing. We, we spoof the whole category of marketing with our water brand. So everything that they do is very irreverent. It's over the top. It's making fun of what most brands do in earnest in marketing. And then furthermore, I think that even the name Liquid Death and their whole persona is, you know, water's all about purity, usually, right? So Fiji, it's untouched by human hands, right. 4,000 miles away from civilization. Many of the other, other brands that are just getting, you know, municipal tap water. So what's the logic behind liquid death? Because I, actually, I would think that would be the Red Bull. Yeah. So, well, liquid, well, Red Bull's already got the energy market. Monster. No, no, but I'm just saying that, you know, to me, that's what's going to kill you or give you a heart attack is too much oh. of Red Bull or, you know, oh, that. Sure, sure, sure. Well, so I think that's a that's an interesting point is that they said, yeah, we don't want to go in the energy market. We, we're just going to make a water brand. Water is actually very good for you. Being hydrated is good for you. It's a, it's a healthy product. And so they said, hey, we're not going to be about purity in terms of our marketing. We're going to be a very anti-pure, anti-corporate, stick-it-to-the-man, heavy metal vibe. 
That's our brand. It's not going to be for everybody. And in fact, some people have been like, what is this brand? I'm never going to drink something called liquid death. Correct. Right. But the, the big thing in branding is differentiate or die. If you want to stand out, you've got to be different, not just better. That was really ingrained in me early on when I, when I started working at BBDO in New York. So being different, super important. Well, there's no doubt that liquid death is different in the water space and they have reframed the entire category. And now you can't talk about water without people talking about liquid death. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what's the campaign portion of insights? Yeah. So the campaign insight, if you've seen like Lay's do us a flavor or Snickers, you're not you when you're hungry. I mean, these are campaigns or Dove's campaign for real beauty. Each of these campaigns is landing on a a platform, a campaign platform that they then own and they go deeper and deeper on. So Dove's campaign for real beauty. One of the things that I think great brands do is that they try to figure out a word or two, maybe a phrase that they can quote unquote own. So with Dove, it's beauty and it's real beauty. So what they did was they took the idea of beauty, started out with a a research um, component about women's feelings about themselves and whether or not they see themselves as beautiful. And a shocking few number of people actually said that they, they thought they looked good. And so because society's all the Photoshop to work out there and all the stuff that's out there is just impossible to live up to all the beauty standards and makeup ads and hair ads impossible to live up to. So there was this ripe cultural tension around the mixed messages in society that said, okay, hey, beauty skin deep or no beauty is what's inside that counts. And so they took that and they said, hey, we're giving people, especially young girls, mixed messages and it's it's hampering self-esteem and it's it's doing a lot of things like that. What is real beauty? Let's let's have a conversation about that. So they built a big tent, you could call it, around the concept of real beauty. So anytime consumers are talking about beauty, Dove is going to be there and is going to be asking questions, coming up with different iterations to show what real beauty is all about. And so they internal, not only physical, mm-hmm. I assume, I assume. Yeah, I mean, it's a very high level brand campaign, but, you know, they would have these very simple ads, you know, billboards. And of course, they, they've done a lot of video, but, you know, they're some of their really famous ads and in, in out of home are things like, you know, showing a woman that's got freckles. Right. And it says freckled or flawless, because oftentimes we say freckles. Oh, that's kind of a flaw. We don't want that model in our ad. Yeah. Let's cover that up with some makeup. And so, you know, they showed people like that. They showed, you know, women with gray hair, you know, is it, is it gray or is it gorgeous? So very simple structure to be asking those questions, provocative questions, get people talking because in an era of social media, what you're trying to achieve is to spark a conversation. So Dove did that wonderfully with real beauty. Snickers has done that around hunger and anger. You're Mm -hmm. not when you're hungry Mm -hmm. and they've ridden that wave for the past 15 to 17 years since that first ad came out in 2007. And then Lay's Potato Chips actually uh, has done an interesting thing with their Do Us a Flavor campaign because they know that flavor is the number one consideration when buying a snack. I've seen that myself with the research we've done in snack brands at Gallant. It's the number one reason people choose a new flavor, uh, a new snack. Oh, that flavor looks interesting. Let me get that. So they know that there's a human truth somewhere in there, which is that people are afraid to buy new or unusual flavors, right? So it's kind of an interesting tension. New flavors are what draw people in, but then people are afraid to try something new or unusual. Until it gets to, you know, the uh, uh, FOMO, right? That, Mm -hmm. That everyone else is doing it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it sparks a lot of conversation. That's another observation from Lay's as well as us is that when you put new or unusual things on the internet, people tend to talk about it. Who wants to try a chicken and waffles potato chip? Some people will. Some people will say that sounds disgusting. Who wants a wasabi flavored potato chip? And the other thing about this too is that Lay's has the, the ability to do small run batches quickly. They can turn out the bags. They can do limited edition flavors based on this competition. And so their whole insight, if you will, was instead of keeping the research and development process under wraps, 
and then launch different flavors. Some might be successful, some might not. Let's turn the whole thing into a competition where we're going to give people the opportunity to vote on their favorite flavors, and then the people will have spoken, and you will have gotten a ton of media attention for these right. crazy flavors. If you enjoy what you're learning on the Customer Service Revolution podcast, you'll love our weekly newsletter, the e-service. It's full of great customer experience tips and stories, includes special offers, webinars, and more each week. To sign up, head to tdg.click forward slash e-service. That's tdg.click, C-L-I-C-K forward slash e-service. E-S-E-R-V-I-C-E. Enter your preferred email address and you can look forward to great advice from John in your inbox every Wednesday. So insights doesn't only apply to like marketing, right? I mean, leaders that are listening right now, if they want to, you know, come up with an insight and and it sounds like, uh, tell me if I got this right, that, you know, insights, uh, you know, help mature brands and or industries reinvent themselves in a way. Is that is that safe to say? Absolutely. A great insight should impact your product or your service, your, your R&D process. And it should also, because then if you've got something that really helps you stand out from the, the crowded marketplace, it should also give you fuel for the marketing campaign itself. So, so if they're listening, what, what's a good exercise they can do besides read your book, which we'll have in the show notes uh, where they can get a, an Amazon as well as follow you on LinkedIn and learn more about you at chriskosick.com. But what's some uh, exercises they can do to brainstorm to, uh, you know, get through your constellation of, of observations and, you know, to an insight? Mm-hmm. And, and and let's take it to the customer experience. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the first things, especially around customer experience, I actually think that that customer contact centers shouldn't just be seen as cost centers. I know that's a popular thing. Like, oh, it's a it's such a cost center. We just it's a necessary evil. We have to have it. But actually, every time somebody calls in and is asking a question, they're giving you valuable feedback for what is quote unquote wrong with your current process maybe your manual for setting something up or any number of things. How hard it is to navigate on your website, mm-hmm. you know, policies that, you know, we have, we're working with a client right now that they say, next, you know, you want to uh, have next day air it or, you know, regular, well, mm-hmm. so the next day air it. But if you don't click on terms and conditions and read the fine point, their next mm-hmm. day air usually takes three or four days. It's really not next day air. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're, Initial thing is, well, it's the customer's fault. They should click on it. And, you know, it goes back to the thing when when everyone's wrong but you, mm-hmm. who's wrong? And, and and one other thing I want to share with you, uh, our, uh, my first business chain of upscale salons and spas, we have a call center, but we call it the relationship center to mm-hmm. change that, you know, mindset of what they're doing. They're building mm-hmm. relationships. They're strengthening relationships. And oh, by the way, they're scheduling appointments, if you will. That's super important. I mean, some people would say, oh, that's just an academic exercise. You changed one word for another big deal. That's a huge deal. And Disney would be uh, right there with you that, you know, they say we don't call the people who come to Disneyland customers. They're our guests. Right. Employees are cast members. Yes. So how would you treat guests? How would you treat what would you do differently if you felt you were a, a cast member, you know, putting on a show. It's a, it's a very right. different mindset. So that framing, that's actually one of the techniques in the book is actually reframe the question or reframe the problem. So that's an exercise that people can do. What I mean by reframe the question is, you know, there's a, there's a great visual image that I like to show when I give talks, which is, you know, if you got someone by the side of the road and they've got a placard that says, what is it? What does it say? <laughs> it says, um, to moms for Christmas, right? That's one version. Another version is going to Atlanta. Which person are you more likely to right, maybe right. pull over? 
and, and don't yeah uh, to moms for Christmas. Now, is this is this example? Are they hitchhiking or looking for donations? They're looking for they're they're hitchhiking. Okay, okay, all right, they're yeah, yeah, to get yeah. From point A to point B. Right, right, right. But another another good example with reframing is, again, let's say you're a restaurant and you're you're very busy. You don't take reservations, and so there's a line out the door. That's a good thing, but you might think, how can we reduce wait times? right? That's an obvious question that you can ask. And that's a good one. And you should consider it. But you could reframe that question totally differently by asking, how can we make standing in line more enjoyable? Mm -hmm. Again, that's a a Disney technique. Hey, people are standing in line to get on the Matterhorn. It might take 30 to 60 minutes. And they've got techniques for for speeding up. That's the fast pass thing or whatever they use at Disneyland now. But there's also uh, all kinds of entertainment things that they add in to make standing in line more enjoyable. Correct. Yeah. So, so reframing is a really powerful way, and that's different than just rephrasing. I should I should mention mm-hmm. just rephrasing the question. You can go to Chat GPT and ask it to rephrase some questions for you, but or you can even say reframe this question. So far, Chat GPT is not smart enough to actually reframe things. I'll give you I'll give you another example. If you think about the brand Band Aid. Okay. Mm-hmm. Band-Aid makes bandages. Yep. And I would say that for a long time, kind of their their underlying idea is how can we minimize life's little mistakes? Now, people at Band-Aid may say that's that's not our philosophy. We've never said that. But but we if want you, people to have those little mistakes, so we sell more band-aids. Yes. But the band-aid itself, it's kind of it's it's skin tone, it's very neutral, it doesn't draw attention. Right. Everything about it is trying to say, hey, yeah, I hurt myself. I cut myself. I'm not a klutz. Let's not even talk about that. Yeah. yeah, let's, yeah. Not, let's not talk Don't about Don't notice that. this. Right. Whereas if you reframed that question with just two simple words, instead of how can we minimize life's little mistakes, how can we celebrate life's little adventures? And that's the difference between Band-Aid and a new brand that's come out called Welly. And Welly sells bravery badges. Mm. Okay, they believe that life's adventures should be celebrated, that scars are a form of souvenir. Right. And so and that's actually that was started by the gentleman who started uh, Method Soaps, who went on to create Ollie uh, gummy vitamins. And he said, hey, let's let's disrupt the bandage category and then sold that to Unilever for a, a handsome sum. So I think that back to your question about with customer contact centers and relationship centers. Every time somebody calls in, they're going to be using language. They're going to be calling in because something didn't work the way as seamlessly as you hoped they would as a brand. And that's valuable information for your engineers, for your marketing department, for everybody all in the value chain of your organization. So if the the contact center or relationship center is actually capturing the the content of the calls, categorizing them, then bringing them back into high-level C-suite level meetings. Say, hey, we got a thousand calls in the past quarter in this particular category. Or again, you could do this weekly, you could do this monthly, but we got this many calls about this thing. I think we might want to revisit the website and how we've designed it. Right, right. I, th- I think we may need to revisit the product itself because we need to be listening and 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 seeking our contact center as consultants because they have so much information it it reminds me of um worked with a, a large five diamond resort and like any resort you know they have the property is vast so they have shuttle bus drivers you know to picking you up here and, and activity and they were so smart something that no one ever thought to do is they would uh, bring their shuttle bus drivers in a room monthly and say, what are you hearing? Mm-hmm. Because to us, the guests, let's say my family and your family were there and we just went to the you know um, shooting range or whatever activity, swimming pool, golf. And then we get on the, 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 the shuttle bus, we're going back to the, the, our room or something. And we kind of forget that the shuttle bus driver is part of the equation. He, he's invisible to us. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll be talking honestly. And we'll say, man, they, they really frustrated me. You know, they rushed it. They cut me short. They, whatever, whatever we we feel. Mm-hmm. And now if there was a, you know, if we were probably at the front desk and the guest 
uh, check in, check out. Was there, we might wait till we walked away from them to mm-hmm. have that conversation. But there's something about that shuttle bus driver that is invisible to us. And they got such great gold of what people were bragging about and what pe- was frustrating people. And mm-hmm. if you don't you know, take advantage of that, like your contact center, your relationship center, you're missing some gold. Absolutely. I mean, Jeff Bezos, I think, is quoted as saying, your brand is what your customer says when you're not in the room, which yes. is exactly what Love that. You, you just described. Yeah. Um, and so, so yes, the, the customer contact center, you want to help them, whoever is calling, you want to help them solve that problem. Absolutely. So they're still the front lines and in, in terms of, you know, dealing with customer anger or frustration, helping them solve the problem. But it's that post-call reflection and looking at the data and saying, we got X number of calls about this, about this, about this. And then more specifically, mine a lot of the language that people are using. Because people talk in metaphors all the time. We talk in metaphors all the time. And so interrogating language is another one of the techniques in the book. So looking at the words that people use in conversations with the context. The, the professional or the the customer is talking in? Look, Both are going to use metaphors. It's okay. just naturally do it. Yeah. Um, but but the but definitely listening to the customers metaphors that they're using and the words that they're using because sometimes these things can then be turned back around and make great marketing campaigns. People say things all the time and then those get translated, those metaphors get translated yeah. to creative ideas for for ads. Yeah, I love that. That uh, uh, Chris, I believe you have kids. I do. I know you have a, a, a young tennis star or tennis, uh, <laughs> someone who's passionate about tennis. So he, here's my final question for you. Give me, a, as a father, what's some uh, good techniques we can do to bring some insights to our family, to our personal lives? I'm sure mm. you applied this at home. Yeah, that's a great question. So, well, kindly. Can- Finally, after 156 episodes, I finally got one. <laughs> so, so kids, we all know they're they're actually natural insight artists. Okay. Yeah. True. And one of the questions that they we like ask, to squash them because it's it's not realistic. You don't understand, right? It's mm-hmm. they'll mm-hmm. never work. The grown-ups know better, right? We know the ways of the world, and they yeah. don't, right? And and so we we kind of, yeah, we interrupt them. We beat it out of them a little bit by saying, hey, it, just because. The answer is because, right? But what they do with their artistry at from very early age, they ask the question, why? They ask the question, why? Why yeah, do we have a hundred times? Yeah, a hundred times. One of my favorite examples is um, with, with Kodak, uh, you know, the question, I guess, you know, like a three-year-old, five-year-old, she said, Daddy, why do we have to wait for a picture? Why do we have to wait for a picture mm. to be developed? This was all the way back in 1947, my sure. dear. But but that question, why do we have to wait for a picture? And that's what led to the Polaroid camera. Well, you're going to have to probably explain that to some of our listeners <laughs> uh, what the Polaroid camera is. I definitely remember, but uh, it, 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 what, wait, was it called the Insomatic where it just came out, right? That's Which, good. I mean, that was the coolest technology ever that that you didn't have to you know wait until i shot the 35 or whatever you know the the roll came in 12 24 i think there were dozens so now you know i i didn't want to waste money and if i'm only on the third picture of the roll that could depending on you know where you're at in life and 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 in the year you know take weeks before Mm -hmm. you you know and you you miss that moment and then you finally take it and and develop. I can't remember. You know, it probably took a week initially, mm-hmm. and you go get it, and and you completely forgot about the 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 second picture on the roll mm-hmm. that you wanted, and the moment had passed, and you know it, it brought back good memories. But yeah, having the Polaroid was uh, a disruption in, back in the day, mm-hmm. for sure. And I and I think that that um, you know with Polaroid they, what they identified is this idea of don't discount the power of the why question. Because again, why questions 
seem like they have no place in the boardroom, no place in business. They're just frivolous, fun, you know, humorous questions. But but again, Warby Parker doesn't think so. Warby Parker, you know, reinvented, breathed new life into the category by asking the question, why do I have to go to an eye doctor to try on different glasses or to get a pair of glasses? And Warby right. Parker came along and said, well, you know what? With augmented reality, you can actually try on glasses without actually having the physical glasses on your face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So asking why is a great first step. Uh, and, and then for the kids, so you said, you know, how can we help our families? Well, I think, you know, giving, letting, in this case, the child or, or you know, advice for fathers, hey, give it some time. We'll let them see what other questions they come up with besides why questions. And explore it. Explore their question and don't shoot it down like, you know, it, it, it's it's silly or they're just being young. Mm -hmm. There is some... There's some credence to the question. It's a good question. And they're probably on to something that we have just taken for granted. And that's the way we've always done it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, why questions to me are the questions that, that usually look at, is there a new way of doing things? Yeah. Is there a new technology, a new process that could be implemented? Then on the other side of the spectrum, there's what if questions, which are all about using imagination. What if... Uh, one of my favorite examples, what if you could trade in unwanted candy for your favorite candy on Halloween? Mm. Right? And Reese's asked that question and they got over a billion media impressions because they, they invented a vending machine that they then had media crews come out and film. And everybody knows that there are certain types of candy that you get on Halloween that you really don't want. You put in the junk pile. And, and so they created this vending machine that says, Put in the candy you don't want, and you'll get a Reese's, which they assumed everybody would want, okay? And their whole thing was, you know, sorry, not sorry. And it got so much media attention, one vending, right. one vending machine and one what-if question. Well, you know, it leads me to my favorite quote, well, one of my favorite quotes by Steve Jobs that leads to experience epiphanies is, uh, don't ask the customers what they want, give them what they can't live without. Welcome. Uber, Airbnb, Starbucks, you know, all all these revolutionary companies, Amazon, Zappos, before they were around, if you would have told me you had an idea, I would I would and I cared about you, I would have done everything I could to talk you out of any of those ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, any of those say you're gonna buy books on, on, online, you're gonna you're gonna buy shoes online. I mean, I'm a different size. In mm -hmm. you know, in a different brand, like both ways, right? Mm -hmm. Why would I buy you know shoes online? But it seemed to work out for them. But they, some of them, still seem crazy. Con Airbnb still today, while I use it, mm -hmm. seems like an absurd concept. Like, mm -hmm. like you know, if you brought it to me, I'd say you're wasting my time. No, I will not invest. And you know, you're gonna be broke. You know, in a matter of months. So yeah. So the why and what if leads to insights, what I like to call experience epiphanies. We are talking to Chris Kosick, CEO of Gallant Branding and the author of Any Insights Yet? Connect the Dots, Create New Categories and Transform Your Business. So Chris, best place for people to get your book, Amazon? Yep. Amazon's great. Kindle, paperback. Those two, those are the two formats. Don't have an audio book. Okay, good. So we're going to put that in the show notes. Learn more about Chris Kosek, and uh, you can follow his blog at chriskosek.com, K-O-C-E-K. -E and we will put how to follow Chris on LinkedIn. Chris, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and joining us today. One of our mutual friends, a good client of ours, uh, Kevin Sloan from KeyBank, heard you speak and, and highly recommended you to me and and um, introduced us and I'm really glad he did. Me too. Kevin was great. Uh, we talked a little bit afterward and uh, I'll also be at the Customer Contact Week in Las Vegas. If you're going to be going out there or if anybody's going out there, happy to meet folks and yeah, talk some more. Great. Thanks, Chris. And we'll be right back after this. Let's wrap up this episode with my mantra of living an extraordinary life so countless others do. Are you bored? Are you sleeping too well? Well, maybe it's time for a new challenge, something that pushes you, scares you, 
questions your capabilities, your confidence, and awakens something inside of you. Whenever I get bored, that's why I realize I need to push myself. I need to learn something. I need to set a BHAG goal. Personally, exercise-wise, professionally, maybe all the above. So make sure you are challenging yourself, not running on autopilot. While it's fun and relaxing, it's not always healthy for us. So go out there and create some BHAG and go after it. Thanks for joining me on this week's episode of the Customer Service Revolution podcast and live an extraordinary life so countless others do.